So I think we're good now. I can access things. Okay. So um, we'll go live here in a second, and 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 after we're live, I'm just going to leave, allow a few more seconds for uh, everybody to be let in. You yeah. know, so you'll see the participants number start to rise. Do you All want right. me to turn off my video until you get everybody in? No, no, this is fine. You know, uh, um, dramatic reveal. Yeah. Or if you want, you guys can come up. But I'm I'm I'm, I'm a little superstitious. I think we have you now. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to leave. Okay, let's go. Okay, Bashan, you ready? Absolutely. I'm going to open up the lobby in three, two, one. Okay, we'll just sit here a few seconds and let people come in. If my internet dies, just tell people that I'm so intimidated by Michael, I couldn't handle my nerves. Yeah. Your internet couldn't handle it. My internet couldn't handle my nerves. Yeah, no, your internet couldn't. It couldn't. It was in, your internet was intimidated by me. <laughs> so um, you have that kind of power over if internet. Michael were so intimidating. Not not so many people would end up talking to him like they do. Right. <laughs> All right. Okay. If you guys are ready, um, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. Uh, I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. Uh, we have a great event for you this evening with Michael Lewis talking about his new book, The Premonition. And we'd like to thank our friends at Books and Books in Miami and Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts for partner, partnering with us to make this event happen. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first though, to post a question at any point uh, during, the, uh, during the talk, uh, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom uh, of the screen. The chat function won't be available for audience comments uh, this evening, but in that column, you'll find a link for purchasing additional copies of The Premonition. Michael, in the introduction of his new book, defines his job as mainly finding the story in the material. And he's done that consistently with extraordinary success through 16 books over more than 30 years. He's found the story, whether the subject has been Wall Street and Liars Poker, Baseball and Moneyball, Football and the Blind Side, Fatherhood and Home Game, uh, the 2008 subprime mortgage collapse in the big short, high frequency trading and flash boys, behavioral science and economics in the undoing project, or the hollowing out of the government under Trump in the fifth risk, just to name a few. Uh, in the premonition, Michael addresses the pandemic. And as in so many of his previous works, he does so through intriguing characters. In this case, a loosely connected group of doctors, scientists, and public health experts who attempt to get the US government to take the pandemic threat seriously, but run up against dysfunction and indifference. Michael's basic premise is that to understand America's extensive bungling of the crisis, you need to look beyond Donald Trump's own mismanagement to the nation's fragmented, underfunded public health system, and particularly the failings of the CDC. It's a compelling argument told as Michael typically does in a propulsive narrative that reads like a thriller. Now, Michael will be in conversation this evening with Maya Shunker, a cognitive scientist who is Google's Director of Behavioral Economics and previously served as, a, as an advisor in the Obama White House and at the UN. And she's about to start a podcast called A Slight Change of Plans. So Michael and Maya, the screen is yours. Hey, Michael. Hey, Maya. It's great to see you. I know we've talked several times this week. Now it's a slightly bigger crowd. Um, so as I mentioned to you, this is my favorite book that you've written. Um, and I, I think one thing that I really appreciated uh, to Bradley's point is that very early on, you give us a glimpse into your philosophy as a writer, right? You say that you think your job is mainly to find the story and then let us readers make up our own minds about that story and about the characters. But that it doesn't mean that you don't form some sort of opinion about it too. So I'm wondering, what's your take on what this book is about? Well, so it really is true. People never believe me, but it really is true that I do think my job is to find the right characters. And, I, I, and it's to find the people through whose eyes you wanna see, see the world. Mm -hmm. And if I bungle that, the book's not gonna be any good. 
Um, and then my job is to kind of draw attention to them. I'm sort of like, I like, like a, I'm like the stripper in front of the cathedral, but, and, 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 but, but I won't strip for just any church. I'm, I'm trying to kind of like say, these people are important and you need to listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, and what I get excited about story is when there is a situation where there are people who aren't being heard, who are important. And, and so, so it is not, doesn't matter all that much what I think about it. It really doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's more, um, do I feel like I've done justice to these characters in their situation? Having said that, so the story is about what they did and what they, who they are. Uh, having said that, they're obviously curated and selected, for, you know, for reasons. And I think of it as a kind of, I, I thought of it all along as a portrait of a, bro a broken dysfunctional system and it not just the public health system it's like a portrait of the society mm -hmm. and that the way they bounce around the society tells you a lot about what's wrong with it they, they, they're 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 drawing us a picture by the things that happen to them mm -hmm. and uh and yes it's more narrowly about the health public health system too but that's not wasn't my that was my target my target was like to write a book here's what i thought this was the grandiose ambition this thing is a world historic event. It's like the 1918 pandemic. It's it's like one of those things that a hundred years from now people are going to want an account of. Like they'll look back. What, what was it really like? Um, and I, I thought if I do my job really well, uh, it's a little message in a bottle that will describe American society now. And and it, it's uh, so that was the hope. That was the ambition. Um, but it does lots of other things too. And and the other like guiding principle is not what it's about. Mm -hmm. It's as my editor, Star Lawrence at Norton, he's been my editor my entire career. It's been my editor since Liar's Poker. Um, his like mantra is don't bore yourself. If you're that, that keep yourself as interested in the material as you can and the reader will stay interested too. Mm -hmm. So that was the other thing. I mean, I just found this thing. I'm glad you think it's my best book. I think it might be my best book. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was an absolute thrill to write like mm -hmm. exhilarating to write. And, um, and it was exhilarating to write in the way that it's exhilarating, the way it's exhilarating to play tennis against someone who's better than you, that you, that you, the, that the material is always on the other side of the net from me. And if the material sucks, I, there's only so much I can do. I'm not going to play my best tennis, mm -hmm. but if the material is like Roger Federer, then all of a sudden, I look so much better than than I otherwise did, and I yeah. felt like I had I felt like I had Roger Federer on the other side of the net yeah. in this case. Well, I, I also think I mean one of the reasons also this book feels really fresh is that the story is unfolding in real time, and by that I don't mean we don't know how the coronavirus is going to evolve. By that I mean that your character's work on infectious disease took on new significance against the backdrop of a global pandemic, which means they're actively reprocessing and reinterpreting their own past in real time. And, yep. and you're kind of live on this journey with them, right? In other books, I feel like you've interviewed subjects like Daniel Kahneman, for example, who's had decades to develop a more stable understanding of who they are and what they've done. And for these folks, they're like, wow, maybe I need to rewrite my own understanding of where I fall in history. Yes, well, that's, that's true. It's not unprecedented in my experience. Moneyball was a bit like that. Mm -hmm. um, and. And like Moneyball, the thing poured out of me. I mean, from 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 first meeting the characters to delivery of book, in both cases was a year, mm -hmm. um, and and didn't feel like I needed another day. Uh, so so I was I because but that's I think that's right. I think that's right that they they were all a little um, surprised mm -hmm. that I showed up on their doorstep. And there were a lot, and I can't tell you how many times Charity Dean said, like, why are you talking to me? You know, I'm just a local public health, public health officer. Yeah. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. You're really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and Carter Mesher, like, don't talk to me. I've been invisible my entire career. I want to yeah. remain in the basement of the Veterans Administration until I retire. And he, he, he was just like, a little mortified by the whole thing. Yeah. So that, that uh, it is true that that I think they think of themselves maybe a little differently than they did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's also true, that, and that is, that was the figuring out who they were and what they were in relation to this event was the trick. 
it wasn't people have asked me like like how do you you know this it's an ongoing event you didn't know how it was going to turn out all the rest that was never the problem mm -hmm. because um because they defined themselves in relation to the event they were basically out of the event by june like it's too late it's over we lost they they, they knew how it ended in mm -hmm. june so there was never an issue with that the issue was like fully processing them that's right yeah yeah and I, I mean did you ever feel like oh in some sense i'm playing as you're interviewing your subjects do you ever feel like you're taking on a therapist role like you're there are traumatic parts of their childhood and past that you're you're forcing them to engage with always yeah but this is not true just for this book all the books are that way if i don't get to that place where they're um where they're talking to me like they don't talk to anybody else that I haven't done my job. And, and I mean, so at one point, Charity Dean said to me, you now know me better than my two ex-husbands. And and she said that I wasn't saying that much at the time, but I got way past that. I mean, I mean, I do. She thinks I maybe know her better than anybody but her sister. Wow. And, and and I know things about her, her sister doesn't know about her. And she just and it's a funny thing. I think the basis at the bottom of all my books is a trust between subject and care, writer and, and subject mm -hmm. that, that it isn't that I'm going to queer reality in any way in their favor. It's that they trust me to really try to understand what the world looks like through their eyes. Mm -hmm. And once that trust is established, like magical things happen. Um, magical things happen. You find out all this stuff. You get to, you get to sort of see the patterns in their lives that they don't see for themselves um you you get to you, you get to you that you'd almost rise to the level where you get to treat them almost like like characters in a in a work of fiction mm -hmm. they're full fully formed people that you're that you're delivering and an, an, uh, delivering an understanding of can i tell a story that like one of the little things one there were a lot of there were moments like this but this was like very a very this book moment mm -hmm. um i met charity dean in like early May of last year, after pestering the California uh, government to let me talk to her. And they told me she didn't want to. They lied. They didn't want me to talk to her. But I found her, I found her through back channels. Hmm. And I went and visited her up her house in Sacramento. We had two really long days together. And after the two really long days, she was really interested in what I was doing. Like, yeah, this book kind of needs to be written kind of thing. She had a view of, of how the system was screwed up. And yeah, I'm gonna, I've decided I'm going to trust you and I'm going to help you. And when she said that, she told me a couple things before she said that. She told me that among the more personal things she did every year was to write down her, 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 her birthday resolutions at the end of the year. It's actually New Year's resolutions on December the 20th of every year. And that she put, had put these on the back of her grandmother's photograph uh and that she had a dead grandmother who was like a like a north star for her mm. and um and i said so when she said she's gonna trust me i said are right, you trust me let, can i just walk around your house leave me in here let me can i look at anything i want to look at you go out back with your boys and i'll just wander around and she kind of went all right so I started wandering around the house. Sorry, I need to I need to pause right there. You just yeah. you say it very casually, nonchalantly. This is not normal behavior. So who do you give credit to in this interaction? Are you this extremely um, charming, disarming character with a nice light Southern drawl who's convincing her? Or is she just an unusual character who's like, sure, nothing to hide? Well, Maya, we know each other. So if you had spent two full days with me and we'd gotten to know each other, and then I said, I'm going to write about you, but I need to walk around your house. What would you have said? Probably not. <laughs> Which is why for this group, by the way, um, I, I was, I'm one of the people who was put on the cutting room floor when it came to potential characters. Um, so maybe that's why. I don't have that type of personality for the enduring project. <laughs> I think you'd have said yes, but that's just me. And uh, I think you'd have said yes, because I'd explain why. In, in her case, it was, I sensed that she, like she, she wanted to tell, there were all these things on the walls to remind herself of who she was. And that sounds strange, but, and a lot of things had to do with bravery. There were like little post-it notes on the walls. And I wanted to inspect all this stuff. But anyway, I'm walking around her house. And in her bedroom, 
her grandmother's portrait, the, the, the photograph is hanging by her bed. I take it off the wall and they're all her most intimate personal resolutions from the last 15 years wow. written onto the back. And it's all stuff that more or less con conventional in the sense it's what I'm going to do this year. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to go to West Africa and 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 treat malaria or or I'm going to you know learn French, whatever it is. And I mean, this is all why we're telling you where tr where the trust takes you. So I get to look at this thing. And on December 20th, 2019, the first line on her list is something very personal. And the second one is a prediction. It says it has started like a, a tingle went down my spine and I called her back up from the pool and I said, what is this? And she said, I had this feeling that this thing that I'd been waiting for my entire career was about to be upon us. And I just put it down and I didn't have any evidence. I had no reason. She's not a mystic. She's like a scientist, she's a doctor, yeah. but, I, but she's a doctor and a disease hunter who's tr also tried to hone her instincts because she knows that like there is such a thing as a sixth sense in all this. Mm -hmm. And, and that moment, I didn't know what I was going to do with that, but I thought this is how, this is when I'm at my best, when I get into their lives so that I see this thing in the first place, she was never going to mention it. Mm -hmm. uh, she was never going to mention that she like had premonitions in December of 2019, that we were about, about to be overrun by a pathogen. And I thought, so, so to, for me to, um, I don't know, to me to feel like I'm doing what I'm doing properly, I need to yeah. get them in the place where I can get to their bedroom and pull their grandmother's portrait off their wall and look at it and see what's on the back. I uh, love that. So, uh, and, and this maybe leads to another question I've always had, which is around how you source these characters. I mean, in part, one of the reasons, again, this is my favorite book, is that the, these characters are larger than life. I mean, like I called you after I first learned about Charity Dean, like two minutes into learning about Charity Dean, I picked up the phone and I was like, Michael, I cannot believe this woman is a force of nature, right? Um, and I'm curious to know when it came to her specifically, and then I wanna ask a few more questions about her. Um, how, how did you source her? How did, how did she ever cross your, your desk as a potential? And um, did you kind of know from the beginning, okay, this is a done deal, like she has everything it takes to be a main character, or did, did it require that moment with the grandmother's thing uh, for that to really crystallize? Um, she, so she was inevitable. She was inevitable because all my other, I met all my other characters first and all the other characters pointed to her. Hmm. They all said, you know, before I got to her, five people had said to me, you got to meet Charity Dean because she's the only one in the state of California government who knows who knows what, what she, we should do. She's, she's a badass. She's like a force. And, um, and they just had a sense that I, that it was this, if I was going to understand what was going on, I needed to spend time with her because mm -hmm. they'd all had the feeling that she had enlightened them. Yeah. Um, and these were not dumb people. These were really, these were, and these were, you know, these were important men who might not, um, typically find themselves enlightened by a younger female doctor, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, I, I, there was a lot of in the air that I just was, it, it was clear she was special before I even met her. When I met her, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm looking for a main character of the book. Mm -hmm. I was, I was thinking, I'm looking for how to write about this. Um, but she, I mean, the, where the penny dropped for me was I thought one of the problems the country has is a status problem mm -hmm. and it's it's the wrong people have the status yeah. that you got these you got these bozos who are kind of like a rotating cast of characters on cable news you know who are supposed experts and who actually kind of like just learned about infectious disease three months ago but the people who make themselves public to them as experts are usually not the experts and and the people who really are expert in disease control are the people who are controlling the disease. And those are local public health officers who are nobodies, who are paid like crap, who get all kinds of grief, but are, are they're the, they're the, they are the soldiers on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And it's a battlefield without really effective generals or the, and the, or the generals are people often who have themselves never fought in a war. 
So it was clear that the I wanted to do in the structure of the story what the society should do in real life. And that is invert the, the status structure. Take the person who's the lowest person on the totem poles, actually the most important in this fight, and make them the most important in the story. Mm -hmm. Once I realized that, I thought, yeah, she, she, she's who I want to lean on the most. But then there was this other thing. Reality configured itself in, a, in such a way that the other characters were all connected through her. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I found her in the first place, right? And so she 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 was the natural connective tissue for mm -hmm. uh, in the story she led you she led the reader to the other characters so that was uh that was sort of the other reason she ended up where she was yeah no it felt like i had watched this really skillfully done seinfeld episode where all the characters somehow are in each other's world and you didn't even have to re recruit larry david so well done there um so it, you know one thing that was so fascinating to me about about charity bean is that um being an infectious disease doctor, but then public health official, um, is, is it feels like she's possessed by this role. Like she looks in every nook and cranny of what she's capable of doing under this jurisdiction and she just chases after stuff, right? And um, so she, oh, hep C might be in our community. I'm gonna rush there. Oh, I need to extract lung tissue with garden shears. Sure, I'm on that, even though all the other um, guys are wearing hazmat suits. like. Uh, I have to go up, I have to barge into this guy's clinic and tell him he's out of business, he can't practice anymore. Sure, I'll do that too. Like she, there's there's very few limits to this person's abilities, right? And and her willingness to contribute. And I'm just struck by, um, you know, like I interacted recently with a government employee who is very much not charity bean. So I was walking to work and I got bitten by a stray dog, okay? So I'm scared, I'm in the doctor's office, I'm about to get a tetanus shot and I'm like, oh good, um, Mountain View has an animal control center. Like they've got it, right? So I'm on the phone, I'm super flustered. I'm like, hi, I've gotten bitten by a dog, animal rescue, like take care of this. And he does everything in his power to avoid having to act. He's like, no problem, just, um, you know, just give me the dog's social security number. If you have photo evidence of the dog, the dog's birthday. Um, street address. I'm like, sure, I will make sure to chase down this rabid dog next time I see him and ask him all the relevant questions and take a picture while I'm at it. And so never gets reported. And I see that same stray dog like uh, two weeks later, right? And so exactly to your point, I was thinking, how do we help solve this problem where we recruit people like Charity Dean into the system? Okay, well, one way is you just find more charity deans, people who are possessed by their job and have deep passion and conviction. That's hard to do. The other alternative is to increase the reverence with which we view these positions yes. to your point, right? It's like, yeah. we saw, we've, we've been on this mission with teachers for decades now. It's like, teachers need to be paid more. They are the, the backbone of our society. Then this past year, essential workers were lifted up. All of a sudden we were like, the mailman is a very important person or the mailman, <laughs> right? And it's like, yeah, or like the Amazon delivery guy or all these folks were elevating. And um, it would be so wonderful if we elevated, especially local officials. And I say that also with the vantage point that when I was working in the Obama White House as a political, I did see this hierarchy form where I'm a political appointee type and there are career civil servants who have worked in the government for 50 years. I mean, these are the true experts. And yet at the table, the shiny new object is the political appointee. And that's where all the deference goes. Um, and so I feel like even that power system within the government needs to be inverted. I think this is totally right. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do with the book is invert it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, try I'm trying to say this, this is the person who, who should have status, who sh everybody should know who they are, who should have resources to do their job and should be in a position where it, you don't, they don't have to be that brave to take the risks they, they take. It, nobody should have to be as brave as Charity Dean is doing their exactly. job. And if you have to be that brave, you should be paid $10 million a year. You know, that, that it's, it, it's not instead of a, you know, the public servant's wage. That, yeah. that was what struck me instantly as being screwed up. It wasn't just that she was under-resourced and underpaid um, and overworked. It was, that, it was that she was expected to take all this risk, all the risk in the system found its way to her. 
The CDC wasn't willing to cover for her. The state of California didn't cover for her. She was on her own. And, mm -hmm. and you know, one of her mantras was, nobody's coming to save you. She, mm -hmm. had to, she said she had to learn that. And that when she took the job, she said, no way, you know, I did not expect to have to be as brave as I've had to be. Mm -hmm. And what, ma but what makes her such a good character is she's full of fear, that, she's, that she is not a fearless person. Mm -hmm. She's a person who's got lots of anxieties and fears deeply rooted in a problematic childhood uh, and has, you know, has dealt with alcoholism mm -hmm. and among other things, and that she has willed herself to be brave in order to do her job. Yeah. And that, that all those things I was looking at around her house, it was all courage is a muscle memory. <laughs> You know, it was all signs like that, telling yeah. herself, reminding herself to be brave. And how screwed up is the world that we have put that, that we've created that kind of pressure on that role yeah. without, without rewarding it. So, so that's, I agree. I think that like, like actually the thing in this case, so there's great hope in this case because it's such an actually interesting job. That if you that there's there's it's a mystery to me that there has not been a television drama uh, built around a, a local public health official. The stories are so they're cinematic and they're riveting, mm -hmm. and the stakes are high, and it, it's just like it's natural material. Mm -hmm. So because actually what they do is so interesting, I would not be surprised if one of the effects of the book is like lots of people kind of think, hmm, maybe I want to do that. Like it's it's what an interesting job. Maybe I want to do that, or or I want to pay more. I want to know who my local health official is. Then yeah. all of a sudden they have some profile that they didn't have before. But that's what needs to happen. I think that's absolutely right. Um, and it was mystifying when I was working on the fifth risk. It was mystifying to me this this the status of the political appointee mm -hmm. compared to the status of the career civil servant. Yeah, it made it made no sense to me. It still makes no sense to me. I mean, there was a badge color. Oh, I don't have a blue badge. So like, I, you know, I've right. literally heard people say right. that you had been, who had worked at the Office of Management and Budget for, for like 35 years, okay? They could recite things, like hundreds of pages, um, but they definitely felt that dynamic and it was painful to witness because I always felt deeply, at least relative to my own expertise, um, that they were just, you know, here and, and here I was, right? Um, so... Yeah. And, it, and it's not and it's not that they're not compelling people. There can be there can really usually there are people who are uh, have tunnel vision and, and are obsessed with their subject. Mm -hmm. And that actually is another aspect of a main character. Obsession is like that's when you know you have something when you have obsession yeah. the, and the combination of obsession with a failure to realize you're a character is gold. Yeah. You know, when, so when someone knows they're kind of like a character. They lose, they lose altitude on the page. It, it just becomes kind of mannered and self-conscious. It's these people who are genuinely obsessed, but don't think anything's peculiar about themselves. I mean, Charity Dean did not find anything peculiar about herself. And she was, you know, she, she was a, a, a person who as a kid for entertainment, read books about the bubonic plague uh, and, and hung models of viruses from her ceiling and, <laughs> and who was willing to, be excommunicated from her church and leave her first marriage in order to pursue a medical degree. Mm -hmm. And she found nothing unusual about any, yeah. any of this. And I think that's true of the other characters, like people like Carter Mesher and, and Richard, right? Like Carter, I, I, this was so fascinating to me, right? He is ADD, right? He is struggling to pay attention to anything. But then he says that when it comes to critical care medicine, it's as though he's being given Ritalin. Um, and I just found that so powerful. Like, again, another case of being obsessed. And then Richard has this near fatal accident as a child and is told his whole life, you're here for a reason. You're here for a reason. He's carrying this burden on his shoulders, right? Thinking, damn it, what is my reason? And then finally he stumbles upon this pandemic playbook or whatever. And he's like, oh, I guess this is it. Okay, this is my life's work. And so- No, I found, yeah. you know, that, so talk about a moment. I had chills when I was talking to Richard about this. Um, and Richard was actually the jungle guide for the book. Richard is is prominent in the book, but not as prominent as Carter for for narrative reasons. But Richard was the one who held my hand through the whole book mm. and is a literary figure. I mean, Richard could I think you know his first ambition in life was to be a poet, and he said writing was writing was too hard, so he became a doctor. And he's a, he was an oncologist. I mean, the way he gets into public service is in itself an interesting story. 
but he he's not self-dramatizing. We were talking on Zoom, he's in England, one night, and we were talking about a particular moment when they were trying to figure out how to model, how to how to build models or you are fine models that would enable them to study the effects of very social interventions mm -hmm. in a pandemic. Like social distancing didn't exist. These guys invented it, right? Yeah. And yeah. are reinvented it. Um, it was thought not to work. And he said he was sitting there one night in the White House and, and he starts, he very haltingly starts to tell me the story because he's embarrassed by it. Because it sounds like a little cheesy. Like my parents doted on me. I, and there's a story that's been in my head my whole life. I, I, I rolled down this 80 foot cliff, hit my head. I was unconscious in the water in a stream. My father by, some, by accident had had a, pediatric, a course in pediatric medicine crit, or critical care or something like the week before. Yeah he, <laughs> yeah, he resuscitates me. And ever since then there was this mythology in the family, the Southern, this Alabama family that Richard was saved for a reason. And this is not a, these are not, a, it's not the Bible thumping Alabama. He's, mm -hmm. he's kind of upper, he's yeomanry or maybe upper, upper middle class Alabama. So it's, 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 they don't routinely do the, tell these kind of stories. So this story lingers in his mind and that it's and when he's in the White House facing the possibility that they won't have a solution to a pandemic. And that by mean solution, I mean, they were trying to answer the question, what do you do before you get a vaccine? Mm. And that you, there's going to be a period where disease is going to sweep through the land. How do you minimize disease and death? That he has this feeling that this is why I'm here. This is what my mother was talking about. Mm -hmm. And that he's embarrassed to tell me about it. It's just, it's kind of incredible, right? And it's where he lives. That's where he lives. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, you know, I think another theme emerging from this book is like your Richard and the other characters, they they kind of quickly realize like it is a fiction to think, oh, oh, someone's got it, right? Like the people whose jobs it is to get this done have got it. Um, and I do like one telling anecdote too is Charity has this really enraging exchange um, with the CDC when she's potentially detecting a meningitis outbreak, right? Um, and she's calling the CDC and it, it totally falls on deaf ears, right? They're basically like, we don't have your back. We think you're wrong, but go for it, you powerless local health official. <laughs> like, right. have at it. Uh, right. You're screwed though. And I, I still remember the day that I realized that these government bodies that I had revered for so much of my life were just made of people. I mean, it's an astonishing discovery to have, right? Like, it's hard to remember. And it's hard to remember, but it's like these people are prone to the same vulnerabilities and behavioral biases we're all prone to, right? Like fear, ego, self-protection, motivated by incentive structures, et cetera, et cetera. And it was akin to my seeing my first grade teacher in the supermarket for the first time. I was like, wait, what? Mrs. Fletcher buys food in the same place as us mere commoners? Like, I thought she lived in the school. Like, it, it, so that's what it felt like to like have the curtain pulled and be like, no, the CDC, like these is now just my colleagues, like well, people. So yeah. So as Ch the Charity put it, she said she was so disappointed. She said, I was so disappointed to find that the man behind the curtain was such a pansy. And, right. and she, I love she thought that. she gets into it and she kind of thinks they're the, they're the, they're the gods, right? Mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden she finds herself actually fighting disease on the streets of Santa Barbara, you know, behind Oprah's house. And it's, it's, it's you know, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis or a meningococcal outbreak on the Santa Barbara campus mm -hmm. or any, and they're terrifying these things. And she needs backup. She needs help in all kinds of ways. She needs material help and she needs moral support. She needs political cover, all that. Yeah. And they don't, they don't materialize. In fact, when they materialize, they materialize to basically tell her, you could take that risk, but if you do, you're going to, and you're wrong, you're going to lose your job mm -hmm. and we're not going to support that. But then after the fact, after she suppresses the meningococcal outbreak on the UCSB campus for which the USCSB um, health authorities are eternally grateful and say she did it all on her own without, with the yeah. CDC obstructing her every which way, a year later, when there's another outbreak on another college campus, I think in Oregon, they asked the Oregon people to call Charity Dean because she knows how to do it. And I, I, it's, 
it's mind boggling, right? And mm -hmm. and that that she gets to a place in her head a couple of years into her job of actually fighting disease, where she bars CDC investigators from her investigations because they just interfere. Mm -hmm. They don't bring anything to it. It, it it's that's it's crazy. And now, now what's interesting is that so the local health officials, there are 3,000 charity deans around the country. Mm -hmm. And they have, depending on how they do their job, they have different relations with the CDC. But the culture is very much, they're supposed to be following the CDC's orders. Mm -hmm. But they, even though they're not orders, they, I mean, even though not, the CDC has no official power over them, but they do, they have, they have budgets, they have, they have money to give them. They, you're not supposed to anger the CDC. Mm -hmm. But the good, charity would say, the good ones, were crosswise with the CDC for just this reason. And her brave, you know, the, the ones she thought were brave and great, which were usually women, not always, but almost always women, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the rich retired doctor who's just looking for a sinecure and doesn't want any trouble. Yeah. Um, the, that, that the, the brave ones found themselves realizing no one's coming to save you. The CDC is going to get in the way. And the brave ones are who got their heads chopped off in the last year. Mm. The charity, all the people charity admired, with a couple of exceptions, Sarah Cody, who's your health. Are you in Santa Clara? Yeah, Santa Clara. All right, Sarah, Sarah Cody. Sarah Cody of, Sarah, of Santa. She, she, she should get a presidential medal because mm. Sarah Cody saw that she needed to shut down the county without backup from Gavin Newsom or Donald Trump. Nothing but grief. She shuts down the county, probably saves a gazillion lives because mm -hmm. she inter interrupting the early disease transmission. And what does she what does she get as thanks? Every Wednesday at Sarah Cody's house, a mob gathers today, still to this day, and chants insults and obscenities at her and her family. I called her uh, like a month ago, and she was in the shelter. She has round the clock armed guards. And she, she was in the shelter with her teenage daughter because her teenage daughter needed to study for next, a test the next day. And she couldn't do it because the mob was making so much noise outside their house. So that's what they get. And that's what, yeah. So there's been this selective pressure placed on the public health system by the pandemic to drive the very best of them out mm. and, and to let the ones who just said, I'm not going to interfere too much, uh, let them stay. And that's something we need to correct for. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there again to to think back to my my time in government. Um, there is almost an allergy towards innovation and risk taking, right? People are petrified of taking risks, and I don't mean risks of the magnitude of the sorts of things we saw during COVID. I mean basic things like running an experiment to see whether a program works well or not. I mean that I remember with the Department of Veterans Affairs, it took us eight months to get them to run a simple experiment, and the reason is that. The upside is so low, right? If they just continue with the status quo, don't cause any problems, right? Um, there's, there's no risks incurred. And so that is the easy way forward. And I mean, yeah, it is lightly alarming that it requires people, people's willingness to lose everything um, in, order, in order to have a voice. Like, do you, do you have any ideas coming out of these stories about how we can rejigger incentive systems so that we're actually leading to the best kind of problem solving, whether it's within academia where like publications are everything or corporations where um, it's all about profits from medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Was that a question? Yes. I Did didn't hear that. I didn't hear. Oh, I didn't, sorry. Tone of, <laughs> tone of voice, the tone of this, the tone of the voice threw me off. I thought it was a statement. So, so, a statement so, and a question. I'm just wondering if you have any ideas of how we can rejigger some of the incentive structures that exist within these different sectors so that the end goal of actually making impact is achieved. So we need to create a recognition culture in government. And that is celebrating government achievement, celebrating the risk takers. Hmm. So award shows that the whole country watches. The Oscars for public servants is a really good idea. And there is such, there is such a thing, it's called the Sammy Awards. I've and been to the Sammys, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's slowly gathering yeah. steam. Yeah. But it should be broadcast like the Oscars. The stories are, are fantastic. So first creating the recognition culture. The second is, it's a big, it's a leadership thing. I, I think 
the leaders of each of each organization need to create this culture. It isn't just like the society does it. Mm-hmm. It's like if you become the, the Secretary of Commerce, you need in the in the Department of Commerce to celebrate the people who are taking the risks. Mm-hmm. It, it, even if it even if it goes wrong, right? Yeah. It's the Silicon Valley thing. If you're not if you're not if you're not screwing up, sometimes you're not taking enough risk, mm-hmm. and you need to kind of tilt the other direction. So what kind of leaders will do that? And I think there's actually a structural change. I wonder what you think of this. They would have a big effect and it would be to lop off. We have 4,000 and something political appointees Mm -hmm. that come in with an administration. They are usually typically with, but with a couple of interesting exceptions, they're just for the tenure of whoever is in the white house at best. They might also, they might quit, they may get fired, they may take forever to get confirmed. Mm-hmm. The, average, the average tenure of these people in these jobs is 18 months to two years. Yeah. That's not, a, that's not a, you're not gonna create anything in a culture in 18 months or two years. Nor are you even gonna think to do it because you know you're not gonna be able to do it. At the, the head of the GAO, this is interesting, is an exception, the general accounting office. Mm. It's a, it's the president appoints that person, but it's a 15 year position. And it's not surprising that the people inside that organization, when you when they're surveyed, rank at the top of the federal government in their answers to questions like, I'm encouraged to take risk, mm-hmm. or I'm satisfied with my, I, I love my job, or I think my work is meaningful. I think it's because of the way the institution is led. We, so we need more long-term leaders mm-hmm. who, have, who have the homeowner rather than the home rent- renter's attitude towards the in- enterprise they're on top of. So how do you do that? You get rid of these presidential appointees. You get you instead of four thousand, you have four hundred, and and you and you sort of institutionalize the leadership in the in the operations, and and they're encouraged when you make this change to look to the best practices in the private sector, and ask what do we do to make our employees at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, as excited about their jobs as um, the people at, you know, Microsoft or mm-hmm. Google or wherever it is. And it, it's, I don't think that's that hard. I mean, I know it sounds just radical and crazy, but I don't think it is all that radical and crazy, especially when we've now seen what happens in an institution like the CDC when you don't have this. And, mm-hmm. and especially when you frame it as this is no longer like is government a little more efficient or a little, a little less efficient. It's a, it's a ma- this is an existential matter of the the, the existence of the society uh, that the, it, we're only as good as our government. Mm-hmm. So, so I think we're talking about the federal level, but you do the same. You can do the similar things at, at local levels, mm-hmm. and and so that's that's sort of like that's that's one fix. That's one fix. And I think I mean one comment there. I think I do think it is a good idea to lob off some fractions, um, but it really is a matter of degree because one thing that the political appointee position is solving for is allowing people, even like a Carter Mesher character who have gigs elsewhere, but are often afforded short stints to bring fresh ideas into government, right? Yep, and so yep. we do see these academics like Cass Sunstein and others who are like, look, Harvard's willing to give me a few years off. Let me come in and revamp. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. It's a matter of balance, but yeah, it's also, balance. it's a matter of the, the but the, uh, if you are, if I say Maya, you are um, the new head of the CDC, Mm-hmm. And you're only there, but you're only, you, you know, you're probably only going to last till the end of my administration. And then if, right, you're probably going to have two good years versus Maya, you're, you're the new head of the CDC and you're probably going to have it for 15 years. Mm-hmm. You're much more likely to bring in Cass Sunstein if you're going to be there for 15 years. Yeah. You're much more, you're much more likely to play, to, to, to churn, to look for innovation if, if, you're going to have to live with what you've got eight years from now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that I, so I think that I don't think these two things are mutually exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's fair. I, I think the, the only other point I'd make is I did sense a fierce sense of urgency among political appointees to get stuff done because they knew the clock was ticking and that can have really positive psychological effects. Yeah. I remember I wrote once to a department of that official, it was 2014, and she reassured me that in 2017, they would make sure to try to implement my change. Okay, so this but, person's unit, unit of time was like three years. So I do think yeah, the balance but, is But think about why that person is that way. Mm-hmm. That person is that way because they're led by someone they know will be gone. 
but, yes. and you'll be, and you'll be gone. Mm -hmm. Whereas if that person is led by someone who's going to be around and make sure they do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And that person is that slow. They'll just be fired. You know, that, that, that you, that, that, that one of the consequences of good leadership will be the organizations will get rid of people who don't, who don't function. Mm -hmm. And you won't, and this whole business of slow walking stuff, because you know, the boss isn't going to be around in 18 months. Yeah. Uh, that, that'll go away. I just think Clearly, our institutions need a refresh. Yeah, it isn't just the C CDC. Yeah, it sounds Clearly, like I'm coming from the political appointee lobbyist organization. I actually don't. I promise you, I have no, 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 no financial stakes in political. Things, no, I, but but there is a tension there, right? Where there is a tension. I agree. I agree that through. that you could tilt too far in the other direction. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And 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 you know, after all, the president is held accountable for the functioning of the federal government. And mm -hmm. if he doesn't have any, any ability to have any effect on it, then that gets a little silly. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but yes, I agree. Okay. So it's, it's, I, I need to make sure we have time for Q and A. You know, we're supposed to let people ask a couple exactly. of questions. Um, I just wanted to end with one fun question, which is, I remember when my husband and I were visiting you in Berkeley a few years ago, you told us that when you're writing a book, you create a music playlist and you play it on loop, like yep. over and over and over again. So one, I'm impressed that your brain doesn't desensitize to these songs or just get tired of them. But two, um, I'm wondering if you could share a few songs from the Premonition playlist. Ha! Uh, let me see. I mean, I got it here. So while, we, while you're looking at questions, I'll tell you what they are. But uh, I mean, it's really like my, my writing playlist, mm. this is not curated for musical excellence. I mean, I'm no, I'm, I'm an idiot with music. I, so I don't, I don't pretend to have song picking ability. I'm not a DJ. It, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, 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 a musically idiotic spin instructor. <laughs> it's looking for, cause I'm looking for stuff that's up usually. Yeah. But, not always, but it's something I just, there's just things I like to write to, but here's Romeo and Juliet, Mark Knopfler and Emily, Emily Lou Harris. Um, uh, Suspicious Minds, Dwight Yoakam. Uh, May I Have This Dance, Francis and the Lights. Fix You, Kelly Clarkson. I mean, stuff that I, I, I asked Charity Dean what her favorite song was, and she sent, she sent it to me. And I thought, that's so curious. I'm putting it on the playlist. Oh, nice. And it was Kermit the Frog, Rain <laughs> Rainbow Connection. <laughs> wow. And she does not think she's unusual. That is definitely Ch Chasing telling. Cars, Snow Patrol. <laughs> So it's just like, you know, some of it's kind of cool and hip and some of it is distinctly not cool and not hip. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but it it gets me going and it becomes Pavlovian. Mm -hmm. If I'm in the grocery store and I hear that a song, I look for like a PC to start writing words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm meant to be writing now, you That's know? That's great. What a nice yeah. behavioral hack. Yeah, it That's is a hack. Um, okay, so, so Peggy wants to know, Michael, how do you decide what to write about? And once you do, what do you do next? P.S. She loves your books. Oh, um, little Peggy. It's a groping. This is the truth, and it sounds not true. After every book, I do ask myself, should I still be doing this? And I try to give myself a space where I could actually answer no. So I usually go and do something else, like a podcast or write a script or just take time, whatever. And I don't say, oh, I've got to write another book. Mm -hmm. I take, I start from the position, possibly no book will ever need to be written by me again. That way I'm called to the book rather than I force myself on the book. So I have to feel like I'm called to the story. Like the story needs me to the point where I feel a sense of obligation to tell it. And how I get there to with any particular subject really has depended on the subject. In this case, it was cheap and dirty. I mean, I'd written the fifth risk saying, something bad's going to happen and the Trump administration is going to mismanage it because of the way they're handling the transition and something bad happened. So I kind of thought I had a duty to poke around and I, and it yielded such gold right away in the form of these characters that I was off and running. Um, but sometimes it's like, I don't go in to write a book. I'm just answering a question. Why are the Oakland A's winning games when they don't have any money? And the answer is so breathtakingly interesting. It just mushrooms into a book. Mm -hmm. But it's always, there always fits. I have the same conversation with my editor. I've had it 16 times where I say star, his name is Starling Lawrence. Great name. Star, um, I don't know. Does this interest you? I, I'm really interested in this, but I'm not sure. And, and we spent three months pondering my uncertainty. 
And, and at some point I think, no, I've learned so much about this and I care so much about this and nobody else is going to do it. Mm. I got to do it. So this, I, this will review, this is slightly revealing. Maybe, um, um, while I was working on this, I had this secret group of doctors who were influencing policy all over the United States because they had a privileged view of the pandemic. Carter Mesher sitting at the center of it. No one in the world, so far as I knew, knew who they were. And I was all in. The New York Times discovers one of Carter's emails and he's briefly in the news. He's a front page of the New York Times. Wow. They, got a, they got a tiny sliver of the story and I called Richard and I said, I don't think I'm gonna write the book now because I don't need to write the book because it's now in the New York Times. And I waited for, the, for all of it to kind of emerge, what I knew, and it didn't. So I came back to it. I kind of put it, I said, nah, no, no, you didn't do it anymore. It's already in the newspaper. So it, it, it is this feeling that it's, if I don't do it, it won't get done and it should be done. Mm. That, that's the important feeling. And how the stuff gets found is like, it's just accident. It really is accident. You sound like your characters. I care about a lot. And if I don't do it, nobody else will. <laughs> well, that's true. Well, that, yeah. so that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah, interesting. So maybe you have that same obsession. Okay, uh, Satish wants to know, Michael, which of your own books is your favorite? The honest answer is, is like asking me which of my own kids is my favorite. And if you have more than one you child, you'll tell know. Us which of your kids is your favorite, Michael? Right here. It's just <laughs> you and me. <laughs> I know who it is. <laughs> it, it's not it's, it, it it doesn't completely compute the question um but but i make i do, will make critical judgments of them hmm. and the and but the way i judge them is the way um olympic dives are judged it's not just the quality of the dive but the difficulty of the dive hmm. so, so the undoing project was an incredibly difficult dive where i made some splashes going into the water Liar's Poker was an unbelievably simple dive that was no splash at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, um, the the um, Money Ball, pretty simple dive, not much splash. Um, this one, this one was a pretty complicated dive and I don't think there was a whole lot of splash. Mm. If I had to rate them, so not, so it isn't like it's my favorite. It's not, that's not, I wouldn't put it that way. But if you said, Michael, you got to put one of your books up in a writing competition 10 years from now to compete against you know other writers who's the best writer i'd put i'd put this one up That's i'd great. put this one up. um helen wants to know what was the most surprising discovery that you made when interviewing researching and writing the premonition can you describe your writing process the most interesting discovery in the material or in my writing process is it is it it's what i what did i discover that just blew my doors off let's go and with that one because i'm not well, that, really was, that, that, that was easy that was easy <laughs> on the ground with charity dean in santa barbara where i was for two weeks and mm. retracing her steps following the boulder path of the of the montecito mudslide where she'd been rescuing people and going through all the the living her drama i, I felt like i walked into a netflix show and i thought how come i didn't know about this person how do, not the, not this person but this role it blew mm -hmm. my socks off the the Right behind it uh, are the other two characters. It's Joe. We haven't talked about Joe DeRisi, yeah. but you know this guy is like is like solving s pandemics in pythons yeah. and in parrots yeah. and, and amoeba brain eating amoebas. <laughs> no, no, it's it's like the most badass virus hunter you've ever seen. And <laughs> and then and then these people who completely rethink what happened in 1918 in order to create a, a national pandemic strategy. I mean, that blew my doors off. So those were to be those three things. Um, in the process, there was one thing that kind of excited me that was new. And that was in a very self-conscious way, for the first time with a book, I just said, I'm gonna go where the characters go. This is about these characters. and I don't know what the story is yet. And that proved to be a very, in this case, maybe not in every case, a very fertile way to write the book. Hmm. Yeah, it's similar. It's like, I remember asking um, someone like a friend of mine the day that I was getting married, I was like, hey, you have any advice for me? He's like, you already did that part. It's about marrying the right person. And so it's like, oh, if you oh. find the right characters, oh. <laughs> then, you know, the story will unfold, right? And that's- you got, you're, Yes, you're building, you're building your house on the best foundation. 
Yeah. That's and right. so if some of the building materials end up being not quite up to up to code, you're still okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Krista wants to know, what do you view as the biggest mistakes made by the CDC in response to COVID-19? Um, we don't have two hours, but please choose one. <laughs> Well, the, the, the testing failure is the biggest. It, 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 I mean, that's the simplest and the biggest that you couldn't control anything if you can't see it. And they, they, they not only failed to provide us with the flashlights, um, they shut down people from providing their own self-made flashlights and, and together with the FDA and made it and essentially blinded us when they're supposed to en enlighten us. So that was shocking and catastrophic and cost, I don't know how many lives. Um, but the other thing I would say is, is, is different. It's not a one thing. It's a drift in the institution to the point where it was unable to stand up to Donald Trump. It just caved. And, and so um, it, and put out, and so it became a mouthpiece for lots of false stuff. It became, it, 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 it um, it lost it. The process by which it lost its ability to be brave mm. is the other side of this. Yeah. And I love that you point out too, like these problems didn't start with Trump. Uh, no. and I think that's such an effortless narrative to have. Um, and yeah. you say, no, 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 this stuff is deeply entrenched and it began yeah. long before. Um, yeah. Okay. So hopefully we can do maybe two more, but if right. Molly wants to know if you could redo an interview in your career, what would it be? We had this conversation two days ago about hating the idea of re-interviewing, but go for it. <laughs> so if I could, if I could redo some part of my career. No, no. If you could redo an interview in your an career, interview, what would it be? Oh, redo an interview. I have very. I don't have those kind of regrets. I just don't have them. I don't. I. Don't, I, I, I. Nothing comes to mind with an interview, because no one interview is ever that important. It's. It's. It's a relationship. Uh, Charity, I mean, I have to spend not not days, but months with someone before I can really get him. So one, there's no there's no great risk from any one interview. Mm. Um, and I, but, I'll tell you something can't, funny. Can't one potential misstep be that maybe you, for a moment, make them feel like, oh no, I've shared too much, or you say slightly the wrong thing. Like, have you ever encountered that moment that felt? I've never dangerous? lost. I've, I've never lost a fish. You know, okay. I've never. I, every fish I've hooked, I've landed. Mm. And so I've never had the problem with someone just saying, "Oh no, uh, you just scared me off the story. I don't want to be with you anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want you writing about me anymore." With one exception, but it wasn't an interview. I, the mistake I made it was with George Soros twenty years ago when I, I was gonna write a book about him and I flew all over Eastern Europe with him. And it was, there was a, there was a masterpiece in him. There was a masterpiece. Um, and it would have cut across the financial markets and government. And I made the mistake of writing a cover piece about him for the New Republic that offended him. And he had previously agreed to just let me be his writer. Mm -hmm. And he then said, no, he didn't trust me anymore. So. That was, I think he made a mistake, hmm. but uh, that was a mistake on my part to write that thing. I hmm. should have just shut up. Interesting. Um, okay, let's do one final one. Uh, unless, can you go over a few minutes, Michael? I don't know how this system yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, there's some really great questions in here. Um, what do you read or listen to for fun? I'm, I read all kinds of stuff. So right now I'm reading Kazuo Ishiguro's novel, Clara and the Sun. Mm -hmm. uh, he's like, how can you win the Nobel Prize and still write so well? I mean, it's it's just not it's not fair. It's just it's it's so good. Um, I, so I read fiction. The nonfiction I tend to read is usually work related. It's usually stuff I need to know about. Mm. I, I I don't I seldom pick up. It's not true. Sometimes I'll read biographies, but it, it's it's I, I tend to read more fiction than nonfiction for pleasure. Okay, there's, there's a tendency there. Um, and was it, was it, was it what I listened to, or was it, was that? What do you listen to for fun? What's your favorite podcast? Um, well, uh, there's this new one called a slight change of plans. <laughs> that is just, I mean, mind blowing, right? Yeah. I don't know what to do about it. I can't, I mean, I, I don't want to write anymore. It's so good. <laughs> so I just want to listen to. Yeah. To, the host is so charming. Totally. Yeah, the host is so charming, but I, I um, 
I mean, I listened to all of Malcolm Gladwell's podcasts because mm -hmm. he, he kind of led me into the business. Um, this is, so this is like, this is damning. I'm not a big consumer of culture. Yeah. I, I'm a big consumer of, of fiction. I'm a sort of consumer of some kinds of nonfiction. I watch, I do get hooked on TV shows. I'm, I'm now watching a uh, mayor of, 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 what is it? East town, the, 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 the Kate Winslet detective mm -hmm. story. It's a soap opera, but it's a, I, I, you can watch, I could watch, you know, Kate Winslet open envelope. It's just so good. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, there, I get, I get hooked on things. I, I'm a, I'm not a systematic consumer of culture. Mm -hmm. Um, just stuff kind of appears before me and I eat it. Uh, but, but tending towards fiction mm. and tending towards television, you know, good television drama. Um, okay, Peggy wants to know, given your last book on federal, federal bureaucrats, The Fifth Risk, and all that happened during the Trump years, do you ever circle back to the folks who you featured to find out what happened to them and what they thought? Thought about what I wrote? I think that's, yeah, I think that's an Oh, question. always. I mean, I can't, I mean, almost always. A lot, yes. Um, yeah. Because you know, a lot of them just are, are totally oblivious to what's going to happen when they're yeah. written about in the book. Yeah. I'll tell you one. I'll tell you what's funny. Arthur A. Allen, who ended up being uh, the the afterward to the paperback of the Fifth Risk in eight thousand words, uh, who basically created the field of uh, of the, 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 it was the world's expert uh, in how different objects drift at sea, enabling him and the Coast Guard to rescue all kinds of people who otherwise would have just been lost at sea because they didn't know that, they didn't know how an overturned 18 foot sailboat moved in the waters. Mm. They couldn't predict where the thing had gone. He, he develops a prediction machine for all these different objects. Author, so this is a story of me and my subjects. This is not, a, it's a funny one, but it's not, it sort of captures the spirit of it. I called author A. Allen to write about him because I picked him off an alphabetized list of government workers who've been fur who've been furloughed as, as, as inessential as inessential and, and i just thought hmm i wonder what he does that's so inessential only saved like eight thousand lives but never mind uh and i call him i said i, I want to come I, i'm michael lewis i i'm i'm i got this book that i'm want to write up afterward to and he, he obviously didn't listen that closely. He said, sure, come on, come on. I fly out to Connecticut from California and I'll spend time with you. And he spent three full days with me. I mean, full days. I interviewed his wife, his children. We went to his old office. We went out to the Long Island Sound where he had floated all these objects to figure out how objects drift. He had cried before me, remembering a woman he hadn't saved. It got very emotional. Three days later, I'm on my way back to the airport. And I get a call from Arthur A. Allen. And he says, you're a writer. You're like an author. And I said, yeah, yeah I, I did. I told you that when I called you. I, he said, no, I didn't really hear that. He said, I thought you, I said, what did you think I was doing flying to Connecticut to spend three days with you and do all these interviews? He said, I thought you were just interested in how objects drift. <laughs> I, I said, no. I'm interested, but not that interested. And, 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 and he's, so uh, I got an email from Arthur A. Allen today because he just read The Premonition. And he now knows I'm an author and we are like friends. Like, so I don't just stay in touch because they, they to tell them how, you know, to get their feedback about the book and all this. I stay in touch because we become friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I know, I, it's the first thing that happens is I hear how what kind of feedback they got or what they think about what I wrote, but it go, they, that gets to, that becomes water under the bridge and we move on to having a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so Keith wants to know if this book dings the cult of Fauci. Oh, you know, I really like Anthony Fauci and I don't want to ding the cult of Fauci. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to go, if you wanted to use it as a weapon, if you're the kind of person who wanted to do damage to Anthony Fauci, I wouldn't approve of you, but, and you wanted to use my book as a weapon against him, you'd say, huh, if you're so smart, how come you didn't know as much as Carter Mesher did in January the 20th? 
You know, it was, it was, he was saying everything was kind of not that big a deal. It was like, okay. And they were watching it. Um, when Carter was explaining why you shouldn't say it's okay. And they were, you're watching it, but to Anthony Fauci's operating with constraints. The Carter measure isn't, he, he yeah. needs to stay, to stay, um, copacetic with Trump enough that he can get up and talk to the American people. So he's playing a political game at the, in the same time, he's doing his very best to save lives. So I really admire him and I would hate it if somebody took this to as a, as kind of something to use against him. Yeah. No, he, he was kind of the man last year. So, yeah. okay, well, we, this will be the final one from Aaron. Right. But it's a great question. So after everything is back to normal, what do you think about the possibility of people not having any interest in reading, watching, listening, or compute, consuming anything that is pandemic related as we have been living this for this 24 seven. If I, yes, if, thank you for writing it. Look forward to reading it. <laughs> so, so no, it's people will have that um, prejudice. I might have that prejudice. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't that worried about that prejudice because the pandemic, we don't get to the pandemic till page 180 in my book. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and I told my editor, the joke of this book is I'm skipping the pandemic that it's going to be done so briefly because the only interest to my characters is the very beginning of it that you don't have to you're not taking on this forced march through a dreary event uh yeah. that, that's not it wasn't what the story was about it was about all the things around the pandemic that led to what happened during the pandemic yeah. and the reader and so in some ways it's not even a book about the pandemic yeah i think that's in some ways it's right. about something yeah. else. so i wasn't that worried about oh people won't read a pandemic book because it isn't one Mm -hmm. It is and it isn't. Yeah, I'm thinking if you were to control place, replace like COVID or pandemic or even infectious disease with just about anything else, these same stories would hold like for yeah. the, these main characters. That is really yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All well, right. Michael, this was super fun. We done? <laughs> we're done. All right. You did a great job. <laughs> Thanks. You did too. That's All awesome. right. <laughs> yeah, great, 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 great moderating, Maya and, and Michael. Um, I don't know why Maya won't let you roam around her place, but you can come over to mine anytime <laughs> and make, make me. I know, I'm realizing I have trust issues with Michael. I had no idea this was really damning for our friendship. I'm starting to feel a little creepy. Yeah, so, so to every, everyone watching, thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, this is Michael's best book yet, uh, so be sure to read it. And in the chat column, you can find bookstore links for purchasing additional copies of The Premonition. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, as well as from our friends at Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge and Books and Books in Miami, stay well and well read.